Good Tuesday, everyone. Welcome to the VolQuest.com podcast presented by our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. Be sure and check them out online at bluewaterclimatecontrol.com. Give them a buzz at 865-299-2290 for all your HVAC needs, whether it's a repair, whether it's a tune-up, whatever you need, they're going to take care of you at Blue Water Climate Control. They're going to be the right guys. They're the right repair the right way. They're going to take care of you the first time at Blue Water Climate Control. Brent Hubs along with Austin Price and Eric Kane with us. You see on the pro- podcast today as Tennessee just a couple of days away from taking on Bowling Green. Guys, in shocking news on Monday, uh, Josh Heupel announced his starting quarterback in, in Joe Milton in uh, what might have been um, – well, I don't even know that it was, it was, I guess it was trying to keep a secret, but it wasn't a very good secret when, particularly when Josh Heupel confirmed what we've been saying. And that is uh, that Joe Milton's been running first team quarterback reps for the last week, week and a half. What is Tennessee getting in Josh Heupel? Eric, I'll start with you. What do you, or Josh Heupel, and Joe Milton. Eric, I'll start with you. What, what do you think Tennessee is getting in Joe Milton and why he's the quarterback for Tennessee? Yeah, well, I think he's the guy with the highest ceiling. Um, I think it's pretty evident when you look at all three of the quarterbacks and and who can accomplish more when when things are clicking, when things are going right, and that's Joe Milton. He obviously has the strongest arm. I think he can do a lot in this offense with with both the run and the pass. He can extend plays, and when things break down, he can make something happen, and that's something Josh Heupel kind of hit on. And I think Hendon Hooker can do that as well, and I think Hendon Hooker, from what I saw, uh, what little I saw during camp, I thought he performed pretty well as uh, as well. But you know, Joe Milton, from all accounts, has had the best camp. Um, you know, Cedric Hill was was talking about how you know he has been on the same page with Joe Milton really since about the the second week of camp, and and he's made the extra effort to get in with his receivers and and go the extra mile and everything. And so it really didn't seem like that big of a surprise to me. And of course, it wasn't for us. But uh, uh, when he went ahead and made that call today, but I just think it's more upside, the ability to make more plays and. Obviously, the coaching staff is comfortable with the way that Joe Milton has adapted to this offense and picked it up at a, a pretty quick rate, considering he was not here in spring. Austin, is this – I mean, obviously he's got – you're not going to put a guy out there who makes poor decisions so you don't think can run this offense. But but how big of a separator is the fact that he can do things on the run with it, with his legs, Austin, and, and, it, and get you out of trouble, if you will, get you out of potentially a bad play? How, how big of a deal was that? do you think when it came down to kind of sorting through this quarterback competition? I think more than anything, Josh Heupel wanted him a quarterback that, you know, can go out and, and win him a game on his own with his play. And that's not to say that those other two guys can't work within the function of the offense. And, and, and again, you know, Josh, uh, you know, Joe Milton's got to prove that he is consistent, prove that he has improved from a year ago, um, at Michigan and, and, and be a, a better overall quarterback, Brent. But at the end of the day, I, I think Josh Happel's thinking, you know what? I don't need a game manager. I may need a guy that goes out there and wins me a game or two on his own. Now, he may make a couple of mistakes that might lose me a game, but will those other guys make similar mistakes that would cause us to lose games, whereas they can't go and make those plays to win those games? I, I think that's kind of part of the decision-making process is, you know, a guy that can go out there and make a play to win you a game, uh, make a play that can change the momentum of a game um, and all those type plays that uh, he has continually shown up in fall camp and made. Yeah, I started to say we, we've Again, he's Ron... not been perfect. Again, he's right. not been perfect. He's made mistakes in fall camp. That's not to say that, that he's infallible. Sure. But he's also had these plays where everybody goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, and like, you know, that totally changed the course of that drive in a scrimmage. That totally changed the course of driving 11-11 work. Those type plays and and those plays, Austin. And if and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it feels to me like those plays haven't just been big arm plays. Although some of them have, they haven't just been using your leg plays. It's been a combination of kind of both of those things. Don't don't you think that it's that that it's just been an athlete making a play and a guy with a great arm m- making some plays a, a, as well, right? Yeah, hundred percent. You know, I mean, obviously, you go back to the first scrimmage, you had the. 90 something yard run um you, you know multiple times in practice he's uncorked one you know a long ways but he's also made some plays where he's been able to avoid and then extend drives with first downs um in 11 on 11 work during practice just little things like that that have helped him win this job so again i think more than anything it's josh heupel says hey i've got to have somebody go and, and and you know make a play to win me a game who gives me that best opportunity you know it again i, I would put stuff in golf terms you need a guy that's going to make a lot of birdies. Yeah, he might make some bogeys, 
but uh, those birdies are going to be uh, prove pivotal at, at the right time. Same thing here. I think Joe Joe Milton's that kind of guy. So you're saying a guy who's going to fire at the pin more often than the middle of the green? Yeah, yeah, he's Phil. I mean, he may flame <laughs> out. He may flame out. But when he, when he's on, it's going to be it's going to be uh, really good. Say, I mean, I only play once a year, but I got enough golf lingo in me, AP. I can carry on that conversation a little bit. Um, so, and looking at the depth chart, and, and and I think depth charts, particularly to start the season, are kind of kind of huh whatever they are um offensively to me there's not a ton of surprises on that depth chart when, when i look at it. it nothing the offensive line we've known what that line was going to look like i don't think there's any surprise there i still contend the sixth lineman is dane davis and they would adjust accordingly um the rest of that offense kind of uh, you know breakdown is kind of status quo to me the, the the surprises on the defensive side of the ball particularly that defensive front what what do you make of the two deep on the defensive line? Well, for me, I, I don't see Amari Thomas on there. That was a little bit of a surprise to me. The the big one was Elijah Simmons being listed first. And and again, all these guys are going to play. They're going to rotate in. Um, you know, depth charts are depth charts, kind of like what you said, Brent, especially week one. But with the comments made by you know Rodney Gardner a couple weeks ago on, on Elijah Simmons and really challenging him. You know, saying he's too big, he's got to, he's got to, you know, take it upon himself to to want to get leaner and want to get in more shape. And it didn't seem like Simmons was in great position at at that current standing. But here he is, number one on the depth chart at one of the defensive tackles. But you knew he was going to play anyway. Uh, where's Amari Thomas? Aubrey Solomon has dropped, uh, you know, 25, 30 pounds, and you know, just looking at him, he looks slimmer. Um, did that put him in a better position compared to where he was in spring practice? According to this depth chart. No, but, you know, those were two of the big ones. Plus, you know, where's Amari Thomas? But overall, the defensive line guys, I mean, they're going to rotate in. We, we know this. It's just, you know, who's going to be getting the bulk of those snaps. I feel like Matthew Butler is going to get a whole lot of snaps. I feel like, um, of course, on the edge, you'll have Tyler Barron and, and uh, Byron Young. Sometimes they can be out there at the same time if you take the star out or if you adjust uh, another formation in, in the front. But uh, those are some of the things that I had upon looking at this depth chart for the first time. Yeah, and for me, I just think ultimately up front, he's going to play so many bodies. I don't I mean, think it matters. Yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I think oh, defensive line is like wide receiver. You know, I, mean, I think they're just going to play – they're going to play enough guys. That it's just – I mean, who starts, who plays the majority of the reps, could be two totally different things. It is, but the Elijah Simmons one is the one that's oh, interesting yeah. because, because, you know, they're, they're, the, the days of Mount Cody are over. And, uh, I mean, you know, they're starting a 350-pound defensive lineman, and, you know, according to this depth chart – and. I mean, to me, it sounded like Rodney. I know it was a challenge, but it felt like Rodney Gardner was saying he wasn't even close to being a factor, much less being in the two deep or at the start in the starting lineup there. So, but again, in spring, in spring, you couldn't. I mean, people couldn't stop saying enough good things about him, That's offensive true. lineman, the uh, you know the coaching staff as well. And so, uh, more than anything, I agree. I think it was just a challenge uh, a couple of weeks ago by Rodney Gardner trying to put it out there in a in a major way. Elijah might have just had a bad day on, on that morning yeah. on the practice field. Uh, when, when Rodney met with the media, that that's that's for sure. Um, I, Ch Chase McGrath's going to be the kicker, right, Austin? Yeah, as far as I know, I, I can't imagine that he's not. Okay, um, I mean, he's I mean that's one thing that we just, there, you know. Yeah, I mean, and that's the one thing we just haven't, you know, we haven't seen a whole lot, heard heard a whole lot about, you know, um, you know, this off season. But the last thing I heard was he he had he was he was ahead of the other uh, the other couple guys he was competing with. All right, so let's talk about Josh Heupel in general at the press conference. Any other takeaways from from his meeting with the media on, on Monday that, that grabbed your attention? Obviously, announcing the quarterback, we weren't sure if that was going to happen. Um, but but anything else jump out at you about kind of where he was or where this team was? Vaccines, he said over 80%. Austin, we've known that for a while. Um, does it seem like they're dealing with some with COVID issues right now? Uh, but anything else from, from Heupel jump out to you guys? Well, nothing more really than the, you know, the starting quarterback announcement, um, you know, was asked about the backup quarterbacks. He wouldn't name one. Um, that's another thing. That's another question that I had because I, you know, we've talked about it before, but say Joe Milton were to go down in a ball game in the fourth quarter, you got to go win it. You know, do you go experience over a little bit more of a raw talent like Harrison Bailey and then put Hendon Hooker in there, or do you want to go a different way? That's a question I have. And of course, um, uh, Josh Heupel wasn't going to answer that today, but uh, the, the the vaccination numbers being north of 80%, we kind of knew that. Uh, also talking about how 
when he broke the news to the two other quarterbacks that he said, Hey, we still believe in you guys. And, and we're going to have, you know, you're still a part of this thing and, and said that they took it in a positive manner. How much of that is coach doc? I'm sure those guys were disappointed. You know, Harrison Bailey and Hendon Hooker were competing for this, but um, you know, just uh, about how the reaction was from the other guys in the room and, and talking with some of the players that met with the media today and how now, they didn't come out and just say it, but I kind of got the vibe that, much like us, they kind of kind of knew this was happening. Kind of knew that this was going to be the uh, the end result because you know Joe Milton's been practicing with the ones for you know ten days now, and so uh, not much from Josh Heupel, but of course he did make the big announcement, which was something I thought he was not going to do today. Yeah, J- Joe Milton, he's been the starting quarterback for months upon months upon months. And again, they you know, as one person over there said to me today, Brent. Did, did anybody actually think this was, uh, you know, a real competition? <laughs> I mean, like, you know, and that wasn't from anybody on the football staff. You know, that was just from some, some other random person in the building. So, um, you know, I, I think everybody's known, you know, that this was going this route. You know, I mean, the competition was, you know, could Joe Milton pick it up fast enough? If he didn't, then it actually became a competition. But once he proved he could handle himself and, and run the offense, it was always going to be seven in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think it was a situation where the question was going to be how much of a door did Joe what open, was Joe for going the to open up for, for the others? I yeah. mean, if he'd have gone out and, and, and thrown a bunch of picks or, or – and he's thrown some, don't get me wrong, but if he'd have gone out and, and couldn't manage the offense and the tempo of the offense, th- then you have a different conversation. But I, I think from that second scrimmage on, in the rain, made an, enough football plays that at that point on I, it was – you know, he was the best playmaker they had at the position as to what you were talking about earlier, Austin. Um, coming up on Thursday, by the way, we're not going to do a mailbag podcast Thursday morning. Uh, we're going to introduce a new podcast. It's a game day podcast uh, that Eric and Ben are going to do. And uh, they will do Thursday this week because it's a Thursday game. And then every Saturday morning, those two guys are going to have a podcast for you to um, just something else to, to listen to, to help you get ready for kickoff, whether you're traveling in, for the game or you're mowing your yard or um, I mean, a lot of people are wearing their iPods sitting in the stands, watching their kids play, you know, some kind of youth sport. I don't advocate doing that, but um, <laughs> there's just something for you guys to get ready for. Um, it's going to be off. called big orange countdown. Oh wait, no, man, that's, that's your <laughs> that's show. A di- that's, that's a different show. show. That's a part of the ball <laughs> network. I don't know what, uh, Kane, you got a name for that thing yet? Have you guys come up with a name? Yeah. Yeah. So it's It's going to be called game quest, you know, ball quest, game, game quest. quest. Uh, a nice little uh, game day podcast. So yeah, kind of like can, what you said. Can we get a can we get an Xbox game at Game Quest? Is that how that goes? To, can we go yeah, trade our Xbox and and Sega Genesis games at Game Quest? It sounds yeah, like maybe a- so, maybe <laughs> so. A little 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 vintage in your in your stocking there, but <laughs> yeah. So it, it's it's going to be a whole lot of fun. Ben and I are going to get in here and get you set for for game day. Kind of go over a lot of the content throughout the week and uh, so, some more. Uh, in-depth um, analysis in terms of breaking down the matchup, the rosters, you know, keys to victory, stuff like that. So a nice little quick start to your normally your Saturday morning, but of course this week it's going to be Thursday. All right, let's talk about for, for Thursday with, without breaking down the, the game and all the matchup stuff because you guys are going to dive into that. What What's going to be the buzz about Tennessee Friday morning, Austin? What's going to be the water cooler talk about Tennessee after Saturday night or Thursday night? Woo. Well, I mean, I think because Bowling Green's not very good, I think it'll be the offense. I think they're going to score points, you know. Uh, you know, somebody put on the general's quarters on Monday, um, you know, comparing this to the start of the, the Lane Kiffin era from a standpoint of real easy win in, in, in game one. And then you've got kind of that UCLA, which is the pit game this year, that UCLA kind of matchup in game two. And, and, and I don't disagree with that. Well, that's you know, a good I, point. I've not thought of it that way. That's Because it was Western Kentucky, right? Austin was that who that, that's who Tennessee opened with uh, when, when Lane was the coach I, I think was was Western Kentucky and they scored sixty points or whatever I mean they had a field day that day when when they scored um, and then obviously with Pittsburgh it got a little more uh, challenging and, and got uh, or with UCLA got a lot more challenging and was a difficult day uh, for, for Tennessee there so I, I had not thought about it that way and. Um, that's an interesting comparison. I'm with you. I think Tennessee's going to score uh, a ton of points um, in this game on, on Thursday night. I think they have the ability to to do that. Um, for, for, for you, Eric, what, what do you think is the takeaway? What, what do you think the takeaway is going to be on Friday? Yeah, I mean, everybody's going to be looking for offense. How does this new offense look? What's the pace? What's the tempo? And, and what we all expect to be a high-scoring game for Tennessee, you know, 
a lot of it is, is it a clean game? Do you have uh, clean pockets? Um, do you get after the quarterback defensively? Because you're good, you're going against an inferior opponent. And so a lot of it you got to take with a grain of salt because it's not going to come what should be easy on Thursday night uh, compared to what it'll be, you know, against Pittsburgh a, a week from Saturday. So um, can it be a clean game? But overall, everybody's going to be wanting to see Joe Milton, his athletic ability, how fast is this offense, how many points can this, can this offense score, and kind of just setting the tone off right for what uh, will be the start for the Josh Heupel era. And again, what we've been accustomed to watching offensively the last couple of years has just been – it's been so bad. And so I, I, it's, it's nothing but offense is going to be the storyline, in my opinion, on, on Thursday night. So Austin, I mean, the offense, offense. We we know this is going to be all about uh, all about offense. Is there going to be a storyline on de- on defense? Because I mean, let's face it, we know probably the least about the defense of anything. We know what Josh Heupel's offense is supposed to look like. We've seen that, yeah. but but Tim Banks is not coordinated a defense. What 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 do you think is going to be the chatter about the about defense on, on this thing? That that they forced a bunch of turnovers. That like I think that's going to be their thing. Now you still got to go get them. But, like, I think they're banking a lot of their defensive success on being aggressive with sacks, interceptions, fumbles, that type of thing. And I I think that ultimately that's how they're going to play defense. It's going to be kind of almost a riverboat gambler on the other side of the ball where they uh, take some chances and see if it pays off. It's interesting, Eric, with this this crew at linebacker – with, with Jawan Mitchell and Jeremy Banks, that that's the most complimentary Josh Heupel has been, particularly a Banks all fall camp it was the way he talked about him on Monday and kind of his aggressiveness and, and how far he's come the, the last, you know, couple of weeks. Same for Jawan Mitchell. I mean, look, if you're Josh Heupel, it's pretty easy to get excited about your, about your two linebackers because – you didn't have either one of them in spring and you didn't have much of a linebacker room. What do you expect out of those two guys? Yeah, I expect Thursday for for them to play well. Um, And again, it'll be more of a challenge against Pittsburgh the week to follow. And then it'll be a challenge in SEC play. Um, Obviously the competition and everything's just going to, you know, increase from there. But uh, you know, Tennessee needs Jeremy Banks this year. You feel like, you know, what you're going to get a Juwan Mitchell. Sure. There'll be an adjustment from, from Texas to Tennessee into the SEC. But, uh, he, I mean, he's an accomplished player. He's played a whole lot of football, and he is a linebacker. Jeremy Banks still, to this day, learning how to play the position and, and trying to play it under control. And so I um, heard a lot of good things about Jeremy Banks and from coaches and from players. And I think if he does learn how to play under control and uh, learn how to go and take on blockers and, and do the things that you're supposed to do at linebacker, then that's going to be a good sign for Tennessee. The talent's there. Um, so Tennessee needs Jeremy Banks and behind him, there's some quality depth now that you didn't have, but um, as far as Juwan Mitchell and Jeremy Banks on Thursday, I think, I, th- I mean, I think it'll be a good game. I think they'll benefit from the poor offensive line they're going up against and, and go ahead and run and go make some tackles. I don't know if they'll have any interceptions or anything like that, but I think they'll go and uh, be able to corral them and make a whole lot of tackles. I, I'm almost in, as intrigued to see the defense as I am the offense. And I know that sounds crazy because you got a new quarterback who can throw it all over the place. Um, but, but I'm just curious to see what this defense really looks like and kind of how it comes together. I mean, I, I think in the secondary, they're going to be better than, than people think. But uh, what do they look like in the middle of the field? Obviously, if they're going to have a successful year, they better have a successful Thursday night against Bowling Green, Eric. Yeah, and I'll add this, too. Um, you know, we think Tim Banks wants to be in the four-man front. But you got to play the cards you're dealt here in year one for sure. And and the depth has gotten better. We've talked about adding transfers at, at, at every level of the defense, getting guys back from injuries. So um, it looks so much better now uh, than it did in spring, of course. Uh, but, you know, the you can do you think, a whole Eric? lot. Of, <laughs> Me I, and I you were running linebacker in the spring. <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm and you played, to... and I'm terribly slow. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, I, I'm intrigued to see what that defensive line can look like at times. I mean, you can go at times with two defensive tackles, but, uh, you know, Tyler Barron on one end, Byron Young on the other end, and go get after it. Sometimes you can take both those guys out and put four defensive linemen down there. Sometimes you can play, which is what they're normally going to be in, with three traditional down linemen, uh, an edge guy like a Tyler Barron, and have a star back there. So um, will we see all these different uh, mix and matches on, on Thursday night? Maybe not, but no. uh, there's flexibility there for Tim Banks now moving forward compared to, you know, what he had throughout the summer and spring. Austin, everybody's going to be talking about Evan Small or Wright at running back. Evan, let's, let's go with a crazy prediction here. 
Evans. Do you think Evans? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, I honestly, I think all three of those guys are going to play uh, play a healthy amount. But I think Tyon's kind of got that that uh, uh, they got that extra something special. I'll say this though: the most electrifying guy is Jalen Wright. So he, may, I think he probably will get less carries than the other two. Um, but he may make them count in in fewer opportunities. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting to see that group. I'm I, I like Tyon Evans a lot. I'm with you, but I think Jalen Wright's going to is the most dynamic and the most explosive guy. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. You know, I, I guess we're sitting here and we could go through every position. I, I kind of feel like Josh Hype was it's, I just need to see him. You know what I'm saying? I, I just need to see, I need, I need to see him play somebody and, and go. It's, it's, I think Austin, you said it a couple of times. It's been a really long time since, you know, the Texas A&M game when news of an investigation broke and all that's happened since then. And I mean, it's just, it's, it's time to go see this group of guys play against somebody and, and sort of see what they are and quit speculating on what, on what they are. And so uh, thankfully we'll get to do that and, and we'll get to see that um, on uh, Thursday night as Tennessee um, takes on um, a Bowling Green team that's got a lot of issues and, and struggled mightily a year ago. And that's something that Eric and Ben will break down in the matchup of this game along with other things coming up. Uh, in their Game Quest podcast that will uh, be out uh, early Thursday morning on game day, and that's something we'll do every Saturday uh, coming up. But um, should be fun, right, guys? About time, should right? Be, should be fun. Don't forget, later tonight, Tennessee Prime will be on VolQuest YouTube channel, be on the Swain Event app, and then Swain Event uh, YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be uh, Joe Milton, Cade Mays, Jason Swain, and myself. Brent will rotate with myself because neither one of us wanted to donate 14 Tuesdays, but we'll donate seven apiece and we'll share the wealth with Jason Swain uh, as we, uh, you know, kind of venture into that NIL world and uh, do everything from Gus's world famous fried chicken over there on Sutherland Avenue. Everyone is welcome to come join, come see Joe and come see Cade. Yep. Should be uh, a fun show to do and uh, sh- should, uh, Draw plenty of eyeballs and plenty of uh, interest from everybody, particularly when you talk about, uh, you know, Cade and Joe being there uh, before the kickoff for the first game. That's coming up later tonight. Don't forget, um, you got Eric on the radio. You got uh, all of our coverage leading up to uh, kickoff on Thursday night. But that's going to do it for this edition. That's, that coverage, by the way, includes the Rocky Top Roundtable's return, matchup piece, uh, 10 things I think I think it's coming up a little bit later this afternoon as well so plenty of stuff to talk about plenty of things to get you ready for Tennessee and Bowling Green but that's going to do it for this edition of the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast for Eric Kane and Austin Price I'm Brent Hubs thanks for joining us have a great rest of your Tuesday everybody <laughs>